Good morning, and uh, thank you for listening so hard and well, and thank you for your service to the state of Maine's environment. Uh, my name is Dennis Chinoy. Um, I live in Bangor, Maine, um, testifying in opposition to the rules. Uh, consider the prospect of an unremitting man-made catastrophe whose damaging effects persist longer than human lifespans or the life of a corporation, longer than the tenure of government administrations, but last for centuries. Though man-made, the damage plays out in geologic time and not human contingency planning time. One pertinent example of such a disaster would be the specter of metallic mining gone bad in our state. This isn't scaremongering. Mining debacles are not things of the past. They are obviously not events that any company would predict would happen, and they occur with some regularity. The last two massive spills were Imperial Metals Mount Poly Mine in August of 2014 in British Columbia, the largest tailings pond dam failure in Canadian history, and Samarco's Bento Rodriguez Mine in Mariana, Brazil in November of last year, the largest tailings dam failure ever anywhere. Both projects were built in full compliance with local law and regulations. Here in Maine, we are at risk for even more irremediable consequences than from these last two massive but acute calamities which were due to breaches in mine tailing storage systems. A mine gone bad at some sites in our state could create a rent in the fabric of Maine's geology which once created, could bleed acid mine drainage in perpetuity like a wound that festers but cannot heal. The drainage could begin during the life of the mine or decades later after the demise of the company that operated it. It could last for decades or for centuries. If by permanent, we usually mean as long as we and many generations of our de descendants live, it could contaminate our water quality permanently and damage means brand, which is a vital economic resource in Maine's economy permanently. Over the last two years at hearings just like this, we've heard a series of distinguished geologists and hydrologists testify that open pit sulfide mining in some parts of our state risks courting precisely this magnitude of slow motion, long-term disaster. Those professional assessments were based on the unique combination of Maine's massive acid reactive deposits, the lack of adequate neutralizing capacity in the surrounding landmass, our naturally wet environment, and the near certainty of accelerated climate change that will bring almost predictably unprecedented extreme weather events. In the face of a disaster of this scale and duration, the, the deliberations of legislative committees, environmental bureaus, or courts of law about the appropriate size of reclamation bonds, mitigation strategies, public versus private liabilities would be rendered beside the point. There will be no fund large enough and no remediation possible. Many natural disasters defy prevention or regulation, but some man-made disasters may be averted by statutes. Unfortunately, our current mining statute is not one of them. We are all laboring under the constraints imposed by LD 1853, passed at the 11th hour in 2012, essentially at the behest of the J.D. Irving Company, which had its eye on a piece of land it wanted to exploit at Bald Mountain in Aristic County. Unfortunately, the question addressed by this legislation was essentially, how can we make mining regulations less onerous to a company that wants to mine? It was about how to streamline permitting 
not about asking the hard questions about what Maynard's risk tolerance should be for long-term environmental damage and public health hazards. Once LD 1853 was passed, the rulemaking that followed has been framed and constrained by the statute's mandate. The questions not asked were, what level of environmental, public health, and financial risk are we willing to ask Mainers to accept if metallic mining is to be done in Maine? Are there certain mining projects that should never be considered in the first place if that risk is too high? How can we determine what level of risk that is? Might a precautionary principle apply in evaluating these risks and benefits? How can we access the expertise to make those decisions? The statute that doesn't ask these questions can't frame rules that answer them. And until we have such a statute, there is no point in repealing current Chapter 200 rules only to debate replacement rules that can't possibly address the vital issues that metallic mining poses. Referring to public criticisms of the mining regulations, the Bangor Daily News this week quotes DEP Communications Director David Medora as noting that, quote, the department does not have the ability to fully address these concerns without statutory changes by the legislature. We understand from DEP staff that inconsistencies between the Mining Act and existing rules create numerous ambiguities that would require any mining application to contend with the lack of regulatory certainty provided by detailed rules. And we understand that those inconsistencies are the impetus for the DEP's annual efforts to reconcile statute and rules even though the department is not mandated to keep submitting rules. And finally, we hear the DEP and, curiously, mining advocates who warn us that these inconsistencies actually render our environment more vulnerable to companies whose lawyers will argue that when push comes to shove, less restrictive statutes trump more restrictive rules. Technically, true, perhaps. But in fact, no company will be willing to invest its time and money in what would be a Byzantine and legally fraught permitting process venture. So, for now, this situation creates, in effect, a temporary moratorium on metallic mining in Maine unless until, excuse me, a new statute is passed. But that impasse poses no immediate problem. Far worse would be regulations that comport with Maine's mining law, but don't address the critical questions that LD 1853 never bothered to ask. You can spare us what has now become an annual exercise of public policy tunnel vision that can't illuminate the critical mining issues that need resolution. The most constructive public policy action the DEP can undertake is to support our current de facto moratorium rather than to consign all parties involved to what will feel like yet another episode of mining Groundhog Day. To do so, all you need to do is thank the DEP for its good faith efforts and work, and then not to proceed any further with these rules until Maine has the mining statute it deserves. There's no rush. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you.